So please uh, start. Thank you. Good. Hello, everyone. I don't think I can well, I see some faces, but hi, Dimitri. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I'm Wei Chao to um hi, from West Virginia University. Uh, very glad to have this opportunity here to share with you um some of the research we're doing on radiation biot uh, dynamics, and I will thank also Greg for the kind invitation and hope you will enjoy the talk. So please follow me to uncover, unlock the secrets of violent radiation biodynamics. As uh. Greg said, I'm going to first have a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I'm currently an associate professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at West Virginia University, WVU. Before that, I got my bachelor's degree in China, Peking University uh, in 2006. And then I moved to Boulder to get my PhD degree uh, at the last of basically laboratory for atmosphere space physics. My degree was aerospace engineering science. Um, that was in 2011. But actually, my, I met my husband at Boulder, and he's, he got his PhD from physics department. So I'm quite familiar with the, the Gamal Tower and stuff. <laughs> and um, so after that, I moved to Los Alamos National Lab, did my postdoc there for about three years before moving to uh, West Virginia University. So you can see, I put the map here. I spent most of my time in US in the mountain area, from Rocky Mountain to Appalachian Mountains. So. Even though I'm not a, a, a big hiker, but I do enjoy the mountain view a lot. All right, so let's uh, get back to the physics, to the science. Um, here's the outline of my talk. I know most of you are not quite familiar maybe with the uh, radiation belt, so I will spend maybe half of the talk trying to introduce what are the radiation belts and uh, what are the dynamics we're talking about. And then I will move on to talk about some recent advances in uh, quantitatively modeling the radiation biodynamics and finish with discussing some remaining challenges and opportunities um, in our field. So for the, let's start from our home, the Earth, right? We know Earth is like a huge magnet. It generates strong field, internal field, approximately can be treated as a dipole, but we know those fields cannot stay dipole due to the strong interaction with the external driver, from the sun, which we call the solar wind. We know solar wind is hot and, fa hot, hot and fast uh, flow of plasmas from the sun, and then it carry both energetic particles and interplanetary magnetic fields. And those particles, when they reach Earth, you know, they, they encounter the magnetic field, and we know particle, charged particles, they don't like to cross the field line, right? They, eject, they get swept off by Earth's magnetic field, and creating this cavity around the Earth, which we call magnetosphere. So basically magnetosphere is like a natural shelter around the Earth. And actually that's also one of the reasons we can survive on our planet. So the focus of this talk, uh, the violent radiation belt is this region here inside the Earth's magnetosphere. And it's called the violent radiation belt. And uh, so I think it's good to talk about, so how are the radiation belts uh, discovered in the first place. I have a slide here. Um, they're discovered in 1958 by Explorer 1 and 3 uh, satellite under Dr. James Van Allen and his colleagues. They found that above Earth's atmosphere, there are actually belts of energetic charge particles that are trapped by Earth's magnetic field. As you can see in this diagram, you see this, we call donut-shaped belts around the Earth, their radiation belt, and then later they're named Van Allen belt after Dr. James Van Allen. And you can see the radiation belt actually consists of two regions. The first one is the inner belt, this one. Inner belt is about uh, 1,000 to 6,000 kilometers in altitude. Uh, there you have both energetic protons and the electrons. The protons, the energy range is about tens to hundreds of mega electrovolts, MeV. Electrons a little less than less energetic is about tens to hundreds kilo electron volts. Um, but we do have high energy, higher energy electrons at the mega electron volt range, but those are mostly located or trapped in the outer belt region. And the outer belt is about 13,000 to 60,000 kilometers in altitude. So 
that's where are the radiation belts located. And now maybe you wonder, so, okay, where are the satellites located, like the telecommunication satellites located? You can see I here I included um, this red circles. They are the orbits of either GPS satellites or geosynchronous satellites. You can see those satellites, they spend most of the time actually inside the radiation belt. So would the radiation belt particles do any harm to the satellites considering their high energy? The answer is yes. We know the radiation belt electrons particles, they can have very important, we call space weather effects on those satellites. Studies have shown that uh, the radiation environment, the near-Earth radiation environment can cause a significant threats to spacecraft electronics. And these hazards, hazards include like uh, deep internal charging, surface charging, and so on. And actually, there have been se several satellite anomalies have been associated with variations in this energetic particle environment. An example is the failure of the Galaxy 15 satellite. And I think that's back in April, yeah, April 2010. So NOAA has done an investigation on this and they found that the failure of this satellite is due to the enhanced level of energetic particles at their orbit during that time. So basically it's a bad, bad time, bad location kind of thing. So understanding this uh, radiation environment is very important you know, for both science and application like space weather applications. So now we think, okay, it's important and it will help if this environment is more or less static, then make it easier for us to predict and then to, to protect our satellites. But the reality is actually cruel, I would say, because the radiation belt is actually a very dynamic system, especially the outer radiation belt and the electrons in the outer radiation belt, they're very dynamic. As you can see in this figure here, uh, this is from long-term observations uh, of from the uh, SAMPEX mission, a NASA, NASA mission. The color shows the two to six MeV electron flux uh, measured by SAMPEX in uh, log scale. And this is the outer radiation belt here. And then it's, just, it's plotted versus time from 1992 up to 2009, the so long-term plot. And then over the y-axis is the L value. So what's L value? I'm going to introduce actually more later, but here you can simply think that as a spatial index. So approximately equal to the radial distance from the Earth center in unit of Earth's uh, radius. So basically here you can think about this at radial distance of four Earth radii, the three Earth radii. So if you look at the color, it means the flux, you can see there's quite, quite, much, quite a lot of variations. Uh, the flux can either increase or decrease by orders of, of magnitude. And then you can also look at the time scale for all these variations. And then this time scale can range like from like hours very fast to like days for geomagnetic storm level and then also years like solar cycle variations. So very dynamic system. And then understand, to understand this dynamics was the number one goal of this um, more recent mission, NASA Van Allen Probe mission. I'm not sure if I heard about this mission. This is a major mission in our field. Uh, the satellites were launched in 2012 and then the mission ended a, a few years ago. So a uh, number one goal of this mission. And then also we know, we actually know what's causing this dynamics is actually a delicate balance between different processes, in, including the source, the transport and the loss processes. So that's the goal which had to understand them, all those processes. But to understand that, I think also useful for me to hear, to start with the fundamentals. So to help us understand. Fundamental, the first thing is, how are the particles trapped by the Earth's magnetic field? Basically like, what are the motions of charged particles in Earth's magnetic fields? So actually there are three distinct motions. The first one is the gyro motion. That one everyone knows is due to the Lorentz force. Basically you have magnetic field, the charged particle will try to gyrate around the magnetic field. And then you see the electrons, they're left hand, uh, right-handed and uh, ions are left-handed. So that's the gyro motion, the first one. And this motion is just perpendicular to the field line. But then, you also, the particles can also have velocity parallel to the magnetic field line. In that case, you will have this helical type of motion combined with the gyration and then the uh, 
a parallel motion, right? You have the helical motion, and then you can see when the particle they do this helical motion, and then when they approach the Earth, you know, getting closer to Earth, because the magnetic field strength increase, this converging magnetic field would exert a force actually along the field line and try to stop the particle and then mirror it back. Okay, so that's called mirror point here. And then you have another mirror point at the other hemisphere. So the second type of motion is the bounce motion for the particles to go back and forth between the two mirror points. So that's the second motion. And then for this second motion, it's useful to introduce an important quantity we call pitch angle. Pitch angle is the angle between the local magnetic field vector and the electron's velocity vector. And why is that important? Because the pitch angle at equator determines the location of the mirror point. So when the pitch angle is smaller, that means you have more velocity along the field line. The mirror point is at lower altitude, closer to Earth. So that's important when we later look at the loss mechanism for the electrons. I'll come back to that. So that's the second motion, the bounce motion between two mirror points. And the third motion is the drift motion around the Earth. So why is that? Why do we have that? It's because the Earth's magnetic field is not uniform, I say in the radial direction. It has a gradient, right? So if you look at this plot here, let's say the bottom, the Earth is at the very bottom, right? And then the field gradient is this, this way. So when the if you look at the particle, the electron's gyration on the equator, you can see the gyro radius is bigger when you're further away from Earth. And then when it comes here, getting closer to Earth, the magnetic field gets stronger, the gyro radius gets smaller. So it bends this way. So due to this varying or the changing gyro radius, your particle actually have a net motion in this azimuthal direction, basically around the Earth. So that's the drift, one of the drift mechanism we're talking about. So because the protons, they're left-handed, so they drift westward, and the electrons, they're right-handed, they shift eastward. So that's the drift motion for this two, no, for different po particle populations. So basically you have these three different type of motions. And then I think the next slide, I have a movie showing the real trajectory of particles is from a simulation um, for this drift. So hold on. I should, uh, how do I? No, 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 I don't want the pen. I want to go back to my, how do I, um, pointer, how do I go back to my mouse? Oh, wait. anyone knows? I don't know, I'm, I'm in my laser point. I want to click the movie. Do you know, how do I go back to my mouse? Um, no, was there a arrow option? No. Hmm. Let me just escape. Mm -hmm. oh, there is a little video button on the bottom left. Right. There. Let me just come back again. Okay, now it's good. So I'm not using my uh, laser. It's fine. So using this is fine. So this I can click. Okay. Let's look at the trajectory of charged particles. You can pick. You know, one to follow, you can see the gyration, the bounce motion, like this purple one is bouncing and it's also also drifting, right? So all these three motions happen at the same time. And then if you combine all of them, just uh, follow one particle and then follow the entire uh, motion over a long time, you will get something called a drift shell, right? If you look at this, you have the gyration, you have the bounce, you also have the drift. So, that's the motion we're talking about. And uh, actually, I also have another movie, which hopefully is fun. It's this one. I will share my sound and that. So this is actually a dance about the radiation bell particles, which I find online is quite, quite interesting. It's from Bolivia. They're trying to all these particle motions around the Earth in a very artistic kind of way. And I think we move forward. We get to move the screen. Some of them, they're going to show them.
<clears throat> and I think later I can. So I think that's fun to show. Let me try to get this back. Yeah, to me, I look at that. I think too much about physics. It's not as as fun anymore. But I think it's it's a very, you no, know, beautiful dance they're doing there. Anyway, so we see we understand these three different motions. Another thing I want to uh, point out here, as also seen in that movie, the time scale, the period of these different periodic motions are quite different. For this each type of motion, for example, like for MEV electrons, the gyro motion, the period is about like milliseconds, and then the bounce motion, the period is about seconds, and then the drift motion is about like ten minutes. So they are very well separated time periods, and because they are very well separated, <clears throat> we can define an adiabatic invariant associated with each period periodic motion. And why we need it? Because this is useful for us to describe the, the dy dynamics. Because we know, because due to this periodic motion, the adiabatic environment is conserved if the variation of the environment field is slow compared to the period of that motion. So that applies for each type. So for example, for the, the gyration, the gyro motion, we define the first adiabatic environment, we call it mu is defined in this equation related to the perpendicular motion and the local magnetic field. And this first adiabatic environment is conserved when, when your uh, environmental field change slower than the, the gyro period. So that's the first environment. The second environment is defined for the bounce motion. And then basically it's just integration along the uh, bounce trajectory along the field line, if you think about in a, a parallel momentum. And usually we use this K instead of J to get rid of the dependence on the, on the energy of the first invariant. So the K is only dependent on the particle pitch angle, the one, the quantity I introduced. And the third embedded environment is defined for the drift motion around the Earth. Basically, you can look at this, this, look at this equation. It is just the, the total magnetic flux enclosed by this drift shell. And based on that, we can define this L parameter, which I talked about a little earlier. The L is related to the third invariant. And in a dipole field, this L would reduce to the radial distance from the Earth's equator. So that's why very often you think L as like a spatial index, but actually it has more uh, physical meaning with it. So this L star parameter is conserved when, your ch when the change in the background field is slower than the shift motion. So again, these three environments help us dis describe the dynamics. So we just look at, okay, what's the frequency of, what's the change, the, the time scale of the, the change in the environment space and try to compare that with all these three different motions, the time scale of the, each to see which environments are violated, which environments are conserved and use that to describe the dynamics of the system. So that's why it's important. And also another important quantity to describe the dynamics is uh, phase space density of the electron of the particles in, in space. And that's basically just a distribution function, F, uh, in 6D space, the position and momentum. And uh, because we have adiabatic invariants now, it's more useful to just write the phase width density as a function of the three adiabatic invariants and the asso associated phase in each motion. So this one will be the, the gyro phase, and the other is the bounce phase, and then phi three is the drift phase. So that's still 6D. Then because you know, most of the time, the distribution is uniform in phase, then you can drop this dependence on the phase, then your phase density is just a function of the three adiabatic invariant. So for when we try to model the radiation belt, usually we just directly model the PSD, phase density, in the adiabatic environment space. So that's why these are the language we use to uh, describe the dynamics of the system. So that's why I try to cover it here. And then maybe it's helpful also to think about you know, F is the phase density, but the directly measured quantity is the electron flux, like J, in terms of the energy 
of the of the particles pitch angle and the position. And this J is directly related to F with this simple equation. So basically based on the measured flux, you can calculate the electron phase density and you can calculate three adiabatic invariants as well. So that's the language we're using. So with that, I, we're ready to talk about really the physical processes of the radiation belt particles and then start with the, the source processes. And then here is a, a, a classic picture showing the different two different sources of radiation belt electrons. One is the external source from outside and one is internal source just locally. So for the external source, like when the particles, they're like drifting around the earth, right? When they drift around earth, they interact with this wave, which is called ULF wave, ultra low frequency waves. This wave, their frequency is similar to the drift period of the particles. So you have this drift resonance we're talking about. When that drift resonance occurs, the particle can get transported radially inward due to this interaction. And that's how you get this external transport, external source picture. That's the external source. For the internal source, it's also due to interaction with waves. But now you are looking at the VF wave, very low frequency waves. That wave, the frequency generally is in the range match the bounce and the gyro motion. So it's faster, uh, higher frequency. So due to that interaction, you're going to change the energy of the particles. So the particles are locally accelerated from low energy to high energy. So that's the local acceleration or internal source picture. So those are the two different source sources for uh, radiation by electrons. Wei Chao? Yes. I, I'm not sure I quite understand. Where are the electrons coming from in the internal source? Internal source, so basically, uh, we also have substones in the tail region, like some injection or some disturbance that push particle in from the tail. And somehow you can relate that to the reconnection. Reconnection can also push particle in. But then when they push in, they're still low energy, it's like uh, at most like hundreds keV kind of energy. Then we need another step to pump the energy further up. And that's the local acceleration going on when, it's, uh, when, that, when the, you have the, such waves and then locally bring that to MeV range. And for the external source picture is bringing in by the waves and also get accelerated while you bring in. So it's a different mechanism. I see now at, at the beginning, did you say that the electrons in the inner belt were like 10 to 100 keV or something like that? Yeah, we're talking about the outer belt, the outer belt MeV range. Inner belt, that's a different, yeah, there's different processes going on. But, yeah. but do I understand correctly that there also exists a background plasma? The with background much lower energies, and these, yeah, are, these that, particles are promoted from, right, accelerated from that background plasma. Is that right? Yeah, well, uh, by background the is even lower, it can be like KeV, yeah. KeV, yeah. tens KeV. I'm already talking about the relative energetic, no. It's so the seed way. population, what's yeah, the seed population? Seed, seed, exactly, you know the, the term. I'm just actually going mm -hmm. to talk about that. The seed population is that 100 kV level. That's KV. the one we, we, we get further accelerated by the local acceleration to MEV uh, range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, no problem. Good question. Yeah, anytime, just ask me and then I'm happy to no, stop and then discuss. All right, so that's the two uh, source mechanisms. And now let's move on to the loss. Um, for the loss, you know, talking about, we, we were talking about the interaction between the VF waves with the particles, which can change particles energy. But during that process, you can also change particles pitch angle because it's like a scattering pitch angle as well. So when the particle pitch angle gets scattered, or let's say, for example, it goes, the pitch angle gets smaller. Remember earlier I said the pitch angle is related to the, the lo location of the middle point. So when the pitch angle gets smaller, the middle point gets lower. And then when it's low enough, it can reach Earth's atmosphere and the particle will get lost. We say it's precipitated, precipitation loss into the atmosphere. So that's one way the particle can get lost from the atmosphere. That's one of the loss mechanisms. Um, the other mechanism is called magnetopause shadowing. So basically the particles are uh, lost through the outer boundary of the magnetosphere, we call the magnetopause. So that's, that's another way it can get lost, but basically mm. out of the system. So how does that happen? It's related to the drift resonance I talked about earlier with the UF waves. So when that happens, it can transport particles either inward or outward, depending on the slope. So when it gets transported outward, 
can get lost and then maybe even hit the menopause and then gone, go to the interplanetary space. So that's, so that's one way. The other way is when, you know, solar wind is quite dynamic, it can change. So sometimes the solar wind gets pushed way in and then that will just you know, take, the particle just get lost further inward. So that's another way. It's a, it's a compression by the menopause or the particle get pushed outward. So that's basically those are called magnetopause shadowing. So that's the two kind of main loss mechanisms for radiation by electrons. Okay, any questions about this? All right, so yeah, no, to understand well, our well, our main goal uh, uh, priority is to really understand this, all these different processes, try to quantify them, model them, and try to look at what's their relative contribution to the global dynamics we, we observed. So that's the goal. And actually to have a quantitative understanding of all this, we need uh, we need a model, we need quantitative model. So that will be my next section. Try to talk about some recent advance, advances in quantitative model in this dynamic radiation biodynamics. Um, for that, I will just first start with introducing the different types of radiation bell models. I listed the three main types here, as you can see. Um, the first one is called a Falker Planck diffusion model. And by its name, you can see it's, it's a diffusion model. It's based on diffusion physics. And it operates, again, in this three adiabatic environment, mu, k, and l star space. Um, the input for this models are the diffusion coefficients. Basically, it's diffusion, right? You diffusion coefficient uh, in these three different dimensions. And the diffusion coefficient, they're quantified, usually you assume a quadrilinear theory of the, between the waves and the particles. You try to assume, uh, do either analytical or theoretical calculation to get diffusion coefficients for the particles. Another input important is the boundary conditions on these different surfaces, as, I, as you can see in this box. But output is just a global electron phase density as a function of the three adiabatic environment and time. So I, it's good to look at the pros and cons for each type of model. The good thing about this model is it's generally efficient. To solve the equation is diffusion physics, and it's useful to look at the global you know, variation of the radiation by electrons. But the limitation is it's based on the assumption of diffusion. You assume everything's diffusion, and it's based on quadrilinear theory. But those may not be valid in some applications. So that's the that's the limitation of this method. The second type of model is test particle code. Basically, you know, it's just you 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 you, you chase you run you check tons of test particles uh, under uh, global, either global electromagnetic field model or some analytical wave model to try to look at the particle, the evolution of the particle flux in time. So depending on the dimension of this particle chaser, it can either be a, a local model or global model. This picture actually is showing the test particle simulation um, under a global MHD model. So the MHD simulation provides a global field and then you chase particle in it and try to get the dynamics for radiation by particles. So this, this model pros and cons first, no, you, don't have, you don't need to assume diffusion anymore, right? It's just fundamental. And then it can include nonlinear, like non-diffusive and nonlinear processes in this model. But the, the limitation is it's limited by the performance of the the field model, right? You provide the field model, those may not be perfect. For example, like in this case I mentioned, it's, it's a global MHD simulation provided field. And we know MHD simulation, they don't have kinetic physics. So you won't have this, uh, we say the VF waves, those are kinetic waves. You don't have that, so you're going to miss some important physics if you do this type of simulation. Another thing is this model can be computationally expensive because you need to run a lot of particles, especially if you do it globally. So that's a, a limitation for this type. And then the third one is peak or hybrid code. That one, because the test particle code is still not self-consistent, right? But this code can be self-consistent. And the inputs, uh, you need to specify the initial particle uh, plasma and the field conditions, like the you know, different distribution, like we say temperature ion entropy for particles and stuff. And the output, you can use that to study the wave generation, wave growth, and the interaction between wave and particles. Pros is self-consistent, right? In this way, you have the feedback from the particle to the field, and that's how you can use that to generate to look at really the wave generation and stuff. And then, but the limitation is also obvious. This one is even more computationally expensive. 
So it can be very useful for small scale problems, but then if you want to apply that to the global process, that's quite difficult. So that's the limitation about this one. So basically three types of models. Quickly summarize is the self-consistency increase from top to the bottom, but the global efficiency decrease. So that's the picture, but then the three, that's the three main types used in our uh, field to model the radiation belt. Um, the stuff I'm doing mostly is the first two types, the diffusion and the test particle. But I'm just going to pick the first one to expand a little bit more on the advances here, because that's what, that one is the most efficient to model the global uh, distribution, global variations. So the diffusion models. Um, this is the equation for the Fock 3D Fock Planck equation we're going to base on for our most of the model diffusion models. You can see F is the adiabatic invariance. Oh, no, sorry. F is the phase with density. And then its evolution is due to the diffusion, all these are diffusion terms in the adiabatic invariance space, mu can L. And actually, if you know, uh, read papers about this, actually very often for convenience, we're going to convert uh, mu and K to momentum and pitch angle because that's more directly uh, easier for quantification purpose for the diffusion coefficient and also for the comparison with data. So that's usually the equation we're dealing with. So in this equation, you can see there's a radial diffusion in L, we call radial diffusion, and the diffusion in pitch angle and diffusion in momentum, we call energy diffusion. So that's the main process. And there's some mixed diffusion between momentum and the pitch angle also in this equation. So that's the equation and you know, think, no, ideally, we just solve this equation and try to use that to simulate the dynamics. But this is quite complex model, right? It's hard to build a direct like 3D kind of global code at the beginning. So actually in the community, we actually start from this 1D radio diffusion model to simulate dynamics. And then that's useful when radio diffusion is the dominant process. And then later, people also develop 2D pitch angle energy diffusion, just focusing on these two terms, that's useful for understanding the fast precipitation into the atmosphere or the uh, energy diffusion for the local acceleration. Uh, Dimitri, you have a question? Yes, that's right. Uh, in the first equation, what is G? J? Oh, G, G is the- G, capital G. Jacobian, now that's some Jacobian you need for, for the equation, yeah. Ah, okay. It's, really, so it's, it's a function the, of, uh, of, of the coordinate. K, yeah, yeah. A coordinate mm -hmm. kind of thing. I see. And also I see you have five uh, or maybe four at least diffusion coefficients. Yeah, in because the I don't top... know what symmetry properties they have, but okay, what, what determines these are functions of all the quantities? Yes, yes. So how do you know what they are? Oh they're there you derive it, right? It's from the mm -hmm. equation. You know what it is. It's not something you need to decide. It's a function. I just try to for short, you can write the whole thing. It's really it's it's a function of like a pitch angle energy or something in the, it's just- But they, they depend on the properties of your, and the uh, intensity of your waves, right? He, oh, the diffusion so coefficient goes... depends on the waves, but the Jacobian right. doesn't. Uh, Jacobian... Oh, right, okay, the diffusion coefficient does. Uh, so... Yeah, they do, they do. They're heavily dependent on the wave and the plasma condition. It's basically mm -hmm. just, you approximate that direction as a diffusion process, right? But then the process, the effect definitely depends on how strong is the wave yes. and the wave property. Uh, you know, like the, the frequency spectrum, all this stuff. And then the cold plasma condition also important and then the magnetic field condition mm -hmm, is important. Mm -hmm. That's actually a complete separate issue we deal with. Mm -hmm. And then you need to have a good quantification of those to be able to get the physics. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about them uh, in the next one. Yeah, but that's okay, thank you. very mm -hmm. key input, very important input. Thanks. This might not be exactly the right time but I, I want to ask about the role of ions. Oh, ions? Does that, does that appear anywhere here? Uh, ions, one example is, is useful, is important for one of the waves, the EMIC, electromagnetic ion cyclotron wave. That wave was generated by ion uh, instability. And then that wave can interact with radiation by electrons and then lead to a diffusion in pitch angle. It's an important loss mechanism for the waves. But That's for the most part, are ions acting just as a neutralizing background? Well, um, yeah, we're looking at, so first for outer radiation belt, for the energetic particles, it's mostly electrons. The energetic protons, they're in the inner belt. 
the high energy, they're trapped by the stronger field at the inner belt. So I'm sorry, we, I'm sorry I've forgotten about that. I mean, is the density of these high energy electrons relatively small compared with the background oh, of plasma? Oh, very, very small, very ah, small. I see. Yeah, it's not going to change the bulk, like mass or temperature of the thing. It's just high, very tail of the distribution. That's right. why for simulations, a lot of the test particle is sufficient because there's not strong feedback to the field. But when you talk about the wave generation, that's the lower energy, then you need to consider that feedback. Yeah, but Thank very you. good question. This is a very high energy <laughs> stuff. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so I was talking about, right, uh, the field, we start with 1D radio diffusion and move on to the 2D pitch angle energy diffusion to focus on the local pitch angle diffusion and the energy diffusion process. And then recently, you know, because the computer gets just gets more and more powerful, that we can directly do the 3D diffusion. So there have been more and more 3D codes being developed, 3D diffusion code. And that's good, right? Because then we can look at all the diffusion processes together in all these dimensions and also be able to look at the coupling between them. So that's that's the current status right now. And then in parallel to the advances in the modeling technique, there's all the advances in the model inputs as we're talking about for the wave and the plasma conditions because they're useful, they're important to get the diffusion coefficients. And for that, there's also advances. And that's the one I'm going to uh, expand a little more on in the next few slides, try to take some examples. Uh, take the wave, like the wave input as an example. This is an old paper uh, by Wen Li. And then in this paper, they applied the 2D pitch angle momentum diffusion model to try to study the acceleration and the loss of radiation by electrons from different types of waves. And here is a good diagram showing the different waves in the in the in Earth's inner magnetosphere. There's like his wave inside the plasma sphere, EMIC waves, the ion cyclotron one, and the chorus wave you have with the, all these waves. Uh, so, and they try to include those waves, get a diffusion coefficient, and try to look at their effect on the electrons, radiation by electrons. And here's the results. The dashed one is basically the initial condition and showing the PSD, phase density versus electron pitch angle. And then the first thing they do is to include the chorus waves, those waves. And when you include chorus wave, you can see there's a strong enhancement from the dash to the blue. So the chorus wave is producing very strong local acceleration, energy diffusion for the waves over uh, most all the pitch angles. Then they try to add in the EMIC waves, the electron magnetic ion cyclotron waves. And then for that, you can see from blue to red, the actual net loss. So basically the effect, the loss effect from EMIC is dominant over the acceleration from chorus. And then they also further include the HIS, plasma spheric HIS in, uh, to, in this simulation, in the green one, you can see that lead to some additional loss over all pitch angles. So basically this is a good, very useful, you know, very important paper showing the, the, the contribution from the wave particle interactions to the radiation belt uh, electrons. And but one thing for this is just like a first test kind of paper. They do the, the wave inputs they're using, they're static. Just basically they use a constant value for the wave power, things like that. So the simple model, but showing very important effects. So to advance on that or improve on that, because our goal is eventually to get the dynamics of the radiation belt. So we develop time dependent wave models. So how do you get that is one way is you just we have a long-term wave observation from different satellite, different missions, right? So we can build a statistical model by statistically averaging those wave observations and then to get the dynamic model and then use usually those models uh, uh, categorized or binned by the geomagnetic activity levels. And that's basically use some geomagnetic indices. And one important one is the KP index, the other is AE. Basically they're showing different levels of geomagnetic activity and you bin your data by different activity, you have an empirical model. Okay, so that's the time dependent model. And uh, this is the results from our uh, 2013 paper. We run a 3D diffusion model and then use this with this dynamic wave inputs and try to simulate these long-term variations of radiation belt observed uh, back in 1991 by this CRESS mission. That's an old mission. And this is a half year of simulation. Um, and the goal again is to model the effect from these different diffusion processes I talk about in the 3D model. Uh, the top plot is the data. This is the data by CRESS. I'm showing uh, electron phase density at a given mu and k but a function of L, basically space space and time, 
Okay, uh, the colors are the uh, PSD value. You can see this five dynamics going on. Red means high, blue means low. So the, the, the can go up and down quite fast and quite uh, dramatically. So we try to simulate this. Uh, using the 3D diffusion model. The first thing we do, we try to just look at the 1D radio diffusion. If we just include the radio diffusion from the uh, from the external source, see how much we can get. You can see we get you know, good, relatively good results at high L further away from Earth. A low L is not quite good. You get overestimation. Then we try to get the pitch angle diffusion, basically the loss from the waves. We include the heat wave here. And then you can see the now we get loss at low L, it match data better here and here. And then if you look at the high L, the red region, the data shows more red than the simulation. That means we need more acceleration. Then I further turned on the energy diffusion from the chorus wave. And then you can see now we get more red. So this one matched the data the best. So basically the results, this result shows we can best reproduce the observations by including all the diffusion processes. That's the why we need the 3D model. So that's a that's an advance. That's an advance. But now uh, something else that this is a dynamic wave input already. It's not static, but still empirical, right? Because it's it's statistically averaged over long term observations, and that may work. It looks like it works for the long term simulation, but it may not work as good as well for strong events. Example is for this next work I'm going to show is the October 2012 event. That's a strong geomagnetic storm. And this is the work from our uh, GIL paper, 2014. So this is the data, the observation. This is from Valen Probes now, this more recent event. Uh, Valen Probe mission observed the electron phase density at given mu and k again versus time and L. You can see you know, this is the level. First, you see a fast loss from blue to green. And after the fast loss, very quickly you see this. This is actually hours, time scale of hours is like big increase over order of magnitude. So that's we call this like remarkable increase of radiation by electrons. We try to use our dream three dream three D diffusion model again to simulate this acceleration. So that's the goal. We do an event study here. So well for the wave input, we start from this empirical wave model. That's the one we used in the long term simulation. Okay, this is for the chorus wave at different AE levels. Again, AE is the geomagnetic activity level. You can see when the activity level increases, the wave power also increase. So that's the from the long term the statistical model. So we first try this for this event, and here is our simulation results. You can see we don't get, get quite much simulation, not much acceleration at all. It's not quite good. It's not good. So we're thinking why, why? One thing we're thinking right. Well, this is a statistical model. How good it is? Let's look at the AE activity, the, the real-time AE activity during this event. You can see it's actually quite high. It can reach a thousand nanotesla during this event. And this is the threshold for the highest AE activity is about 300. So you can see it's very active event. So that means this statistically average wave model may not be well representing the wave power during this real event. So we need a better or say event specific wave input, a better wave input. So how do we do that? You know, the wave measurements, they are very sparse in space. You don't have good measurements all the way, especially if you want for specific events. The good thing or the one technique we develop is we call proxy model. So basically we use the particle to infer the wave because we know waves can precipitate particles. So we look at the low energy particles precipitated at low altitude, use that measurements to infer the wave at the equator. So that's, a, I'm going, not going to talk about details, that's a, a technique. So use that, you can infer the wave there, and then use, and then this proxy model can very, very powerful to specify in the wave uh, all around, all the way around the Earth for this event in real time. So that's the event specific wave model we use. And by, let's try to imp implement that in the model, see how that works. So here's the new simulation results with the real-time wave inputs, okay? We get more acceleration, that's good, but still far away from the observation, far less than the observation. So what's going on? What are, what, what's still missing? What are we missing here? And as we talked about earlier in the discussion, we know the local acceleration from low energy to high energy, you not only need strong waves, you also need sufficient CD electrons, lower energy electrons to get accelerated from. 
So that, how about we, we also try to improve that input? Okay, so one way we can do it, we can also make it event specific to use the event specific input for the CD electrons because valent radiation, valent belt, valent probes, sorry, valent probes, the satellite also the measure electrons from low energy all the way to high energy. So we can use the real time measurements from the satellite at low energy, like say 100 keV. We use the direct measurements in real time as the low energy boundary for our model, and we put that in. So that's the event specific CD electron put into the model. So let's see how much that can help. So after doing that, here's the results. You can see that now we match the observation very well. We get acceleration. So this work shows that both the event specific chorus wave and the event specific CD electron, they're both critical to get this strong acceleration for this in intense event. So that's the Quick review, I talk about advance and then some very, you know, hopefully successful examples showing how we can capture the dynamics. But ho I hope we don't get the feeling that we, we can explain everything because that's not true. There's still many challenges and opportunities. So the first one is this, is we still cannot fully explain the complex vari variability of radiation by electrons, especially during geomagnetic storms. So this is a famous uh, figure from uh, Reeves et al. It shows, basically shows for similar size geomagnetic storms, you can have very different response in the radiation belt. So the storm dis disturbance level, now you're using a different index, it's called DST. Basically it's just showing the geomagnetic disturbance level. This For these three events, they're around the same DST level, like negative 75. But if you look at response in radiation belt, very different. This one lead to a net increase after storm. This one is net decrease. This one basically no change at all. So this is one of the most important challenges in our field. Just can we reproduce this variability during the storms? And then also more importantly, can we predict them? This is useful for space weather applications. And this provides opportunity for us to keep improve our model, right? Because there's the stuff we can improve. First is the model input. I said, there's advance in making the input more realistic, but there's more we can do. And also something else, so it's like maybe we're missing some physics. Maybe there's some new physics we need to include other than the stuff we look at right now. And that's this slide I'm going to quickly cover is recently there have been like new mechanisms being recognized, which can also contribute to radiation belt. One hey, like, Michelle? yes. Uh, can I ask, when you talk about uh, prediction, Yeah. Uh, what's the time scale that's challenging, but you hope it might be possible? Well, you, now we can, because uh, if we can do like a a day ahead, that's that's already good enough, but that we cannot do as well, uh, that, that well already. Especially when you talk about like this, uh, some strong event that we can, um, we cannot do. Yeah. Yeah. But the, if we can do like three days, that's even better, right? But now even a day is hard, it's hard to get. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're talking about new mechanisms, for example, like a nonlinear wave pattern direction I mentioned, but uh, no, I didn't talk too much. And there's the other things like a drift orbit bifurcation, field line coverage, scaring those details. Those new mechanisms could also contribute, but the question here is what's the relative importance of this non-traditional mechanism compared to the traditional mechanisms? That's still unknown. We don't know, we still need work to do there. So I put an example here. This is just a paper showing the some other mechanism may be important. On the right here, this is the observation at low Earth's orbit. You can see this burst, the very fast time scale. It's like a uh, hundreds milliseconds. This very fast burst of electrons of uh, the precipitation electrons at low altitude. We call this microburst. And we try to understand what are they because those can be important to the loss of the particles because they're precipitation. And then we try to understand it. And then the first thing we do is use the diffusion type of like quadrilinear theory to try to predict it. And then this colored one on the left, there are the simulation results. And then the black is the one second average data, not the high resolution anymore. You can see the quadrilinear theory can more or less explain the the bulk part, the one second average part, like it cannot get this fast burst. I mean, as we expected, because it's not even the physics included. So, so they're not, 
they cannot be explained. And then, but then there are also theories and discussion about this can be due to nonlinear wave pattern direction due to the time scale and also some similarity with the waves observed. So that's the thing, like really what's the importance of this nonlinear wave pattern direction to the dynamics we observe? That's still an outstanding question. To understand that, we need to quantify those processes better and also to couple them into the global model. That's another challenge. And I will skip this, the other mechanism here just for the time. And uh, the next challenge is how do we physically model radiation belt in this highly coupled system of inner magnetosphere? As you see, you know, for inner magnetosphere in this, in this plot, in this cross section plot, not only have radiation belt, there's other plasma systems, current systems, a lot of stuff going on there, and they're coupled together. So how do we simulate the coupled system? For example, well, two things I can say is the, the blue one is the plasma sphere, the cold plasma region, and then there's a ring current region around the Earth. These two, this radiation belt, they co locate with the radiation belt. So there's strong coupling between all the three as shown here. The, these two ring current plasma sphere, they provide very important inputs to radiation belt. Radiation belt also can have feedback to them. So how do we couple them? We need, the opportunities, we need comprehensive models to couple them together in a self-consistent way. So that's still, it's like more global scale, multi, multi-population kind of big uh, simulations needed. And next one is the final one. I won't say, no, Earth is not the only planet in the solar system that has radiation belt. The radiation belt have been discovered in other, like we need strongly magnetized planet. For example, Jupiter and Saturn, they also have radiation belt. So the other, ch the other challenge is, how do the radiation belt within this very different planetary system compare with each other? For example, Jupiter, you know, it's much bigger, much more massive. Jupiter is mainly driven e internally by its rotation, but we know my, our Earth's magnetosphere is externally driven by the solar wind. So they're very different planetary systems, but they both have radiation belt. So how do we compare these different systems to try to understand better? And also, can we extract what we learn between systems? So that's also, some uh, very interesting research going on in the radiation belt community right now. Okay, I think that's my last slide. So uh, to conclude, radiation belt, very dynamic and complicated system due to this delicate balance between different source, transport and loss processes. And great progress has been made in quantitative model this environment. There have been advances in both the modeling technique and also the model input. But you know, our job is not done. There's still great challenges on producing first the complex storm responses in radiation belt, looking at new physics, although the coupling of radiation belt to other systems and eventually exploring beyond Earth. So this opens up a lot of great opportunities for us to do more exciting research. So that's all, you know, I hope you find radiation belt fun and, and, and attractive, like the symptoms, you know, this is, it's donut, donut. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you, Wei Chang. Great talk. Very interesting. Um, yes, I guess uh, I, I may have some questions. Okay. Go somebody ahead. Somebody else wants to. Uh, so, so as I understand, so the the outer the the inner belt is like around two Earth radii. The outer belt between two and ten, or something like this. Right? Uh, three, three ish. Three. Yeah, three, three ish. Okay. Two. Yeah, yeah. And so this is within the magnetopause. Yes. Yes. Right. Uh. Are there any extreme events? So if there is a some very well, I'm not sure how to phrase it, but um, if there is an extremely strong uh, solar flare, let's say, or CME coming our way and uh, perturbing the magnetopause, what happens to these belts, and especially the outer belt, belt which right. is more, one direct thing I mentioned the the magnetopause shadowing effect so usually during like very strong like shock like you have strong shock yeah right 
high dynamic pressure push the magnetopause way in, the magnetopause can even cross the geosynchronous satellite uh, orbit, geosynchronous orbit, six mm -hmm. point, within 6.6. .6. When it push in, it just wash out the radiation by electrons outside. So, so it, in fact, there was recently, I thought there was, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but there was an event where they detected that one of the radiation belts disappeared, or instead of two, there was only one, or something like this. I don't remember. Uh, wasn't there? Oh, you mean some the period of time. Three, the three belts thing? Or maybe um, three belts, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember something strange, You're right? Something. That, right, right. That that strange. one is due to the, the actually, it's the compression of the plasma pulse. That's something different, but it's related oh. to the sun. The compression of the plasma pulse, and then the outer belt gets transported way in. So mm -hmm. usually, this inner belt, outer belt, there's a slow region. Right. Yeah. And the outer belt get way in, so they get mm -hmm. to actually penetrate into the slow region for a while. And mm -hmm. then when the plasma pulse recovered to 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 bigger sphere, and then they create some wave locally, and then get scattered. So basically, the earlier stuff get transported in, stays there. For a while, mm -hmm. so you get a you get basically you get a third belt in the slow region, and that slow region it can stay a long time. So that's why you have kind of three belt. Uh, it doesn't stay forever. It eventually, it gets decay. But, but that's in general, how... yeah. So is it understood why there are two belts? Why there isn't one continuous oh, yeah. belt? Yeah, the slow region, you you have the wave. It's also due to the wave. It's plasma oh, also... the heat wave that scatters uh -huh. the electrons in that region, and that's ah, why you get the yeah, yeah. So when particles, energetic particles, get into this region between the two belts, because of, so these these waves quickly scatter them to Not small pitch angles. Actually, it's oh, a long term. Know. It's like a no. ten okay, day. Okay. Something. Okay. Okay. But it's some different. right. So, so they get what, evacuated from there quickly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Get but lost. if you look at a shorter scale, you can see it get filled. The slow region can get uh, penetrated, get filled mm -hmm. for like a, a few a, a little while, and then decay away. Yeah. 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 So that's why when people talk about three belt, we say, oh, it's, it's exciting to people not in the field, but in the field, it's like, okay, that's something we kind of no, no, <laughs> we can't have. Ah, I see. Okay. But it's, okay. the great thing is the random probes, the observation is just so, it's just great observation, high quality, everything resolution wise. So you haven't seen stuff that clear before. Mm -hmm. and that's the thing resolution, the time resolution, the space, the energy, everything is just. Unprecedented, unprecedented. That's why you know the new, the mission is really bringing a lot of you no know, not not all discovery, but definitely a lot of confirmation, a lot of like new okay. level of understanding. Okay. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> what what stops the radiation belt from expanding to even larger radii? Oh, that's the boundary. You need the trapping. So you still need a strong magnet for the trapping. <coughs> when you get further away. The field get like further stretched, or it's just not that strong, so it's hard to trap particles at this energy. Yeah, we call it, we call it trapping boundary. Yeah, you can actually calculate that. Oh, okay. Good okay. question. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I presume that um, radiation losses, like synchrotron radiation or cyclotron, are not important here. Are they? Not important here. Not important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. But for, I think for some planetary, for the other planet, that can be more important. Maybe mm -hmm. yeah, for, for, the, for this Earth, it's not as important. Okay, okay, I see. And the, the mean free path is extremely long. Yeah, the collision is not important mm -hmm. either. Yeah, of course, except when particles get close to the yeah, that's why the regions of the Earth, if they have small pitch angles, right? They penetrate, right. as you said. Yeah, an interesting thing I like, you know, we talk about these three different systems. There's plasma sphere, there's ring current, there's radiation belt. Plasma mm -hmm. sphere is the cold plasma. So that's say we say that carries the mass in yeah. the in the magnetosphere. Ring current is a higher energy, a little bit higher than plasma sphere. So and it's also high high flux intensity wise. So mm -hmm. it, we say that carries the energy of the plasma sphere, of, of the magnetosphere. The um, plasma sphere is the mass, ring current is the energy. And when we say radiation belt, it carries the money because, because it has space weather effect. <laughs> oh, know? I see. I see. <laughs> okay, okay. Fair enough. And that's a good point. <laughs> so these are uh, the ring current by itself and the plasma sphere by itself. 
their effect on satellites is is negligible, right? It's only uh, radiation. The current is already a little higher. That one we can you can have uh, some internal charging, or mm. surface charging. Sorry, surface charging as well. The, that level already have effect. It's different effect. Different energy have different effects. But mm -hmm. the plasma sphere not much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And just to get a feeling, let's say at four Earth radii at the equator. Mm which is in the outer belt, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. If, if, if you ask how many, what's the density of electrons at the one MeV or some oh. other figure? I mean, so just to get the, then, what's the density of these particles? Uh, how, how low is it? And that is a good question. I should, I do have a, I don't have a figure here. I, what we're looking at is just a flux level, but uh, density, I don't want to just make up number because there's a paper looking at the density at different regions as well. Yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. I don't have a good number. It's very no, low okay. compared okay. to the others. All those are magnitude lower. Others, oh, fine. Okay. I, I don't. I don't have a good number. Sorry. Yeah, I, I should no, know. No, that's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, well, very interesting stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we had a recent seminar about tall thrusters, which also have strongly magnetized electrons. And we learned that a major problem is the anomalous transport across the magnetic field. Now in, in this problem, it seems like you also have lots of transport across the magnetic field, which you attributed, for example, to waves. Right, right. The waves, like the radio transport is definitely across yeah, due to the resonance. Uh, that's a drift resonance because drift is, yeah, it's radio. And then you get transport to the, across the field line. Um, the, so you, is that generally felt that that's the, that across magnetic field transport is very well understood in this regime? Um, Jan, in, uh, some level is, yeah, that's the very early study because that, that wave, the UF waves, their uh, lower frequency is easier to observe them either on the ground or in space. So that's the very early wave measurements we have. And then that is you. It's very like the very just in the field. The first few papers looking at that magnetism. So more or less, we know you know the the physics and then the 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 quantitative kind of the transport rate. But there's still some also detailed stuff like uh, just like how that was the because the no. Like the waves can have a spatial distribution. Usually sometimes you assume it's global, but sometimes it can be very localized as well. So that type of thing, we don't know because that would have effect on the particles. And also there's some something about, we assume also that transport is radio diffusion. It's a diffusive kind of process, but also studies showing sometimes can be non-diffusive due to some certain type of wave property. So, but if it's non-diffusive, how do we model that properly in the global global simulations, but that's also uh, undergoing kind of work. Yeah. Yeah, the, for the field, sometimes I say, you no. Know, earlier we, we think radio diffusion can explain everything. But then later when you have high resolution data, you see faster stuff. And then at the also clear picture, you find, oh, radio diffusion cannot explain that that much at that time scale. Then you, you add in chorus, like local acceleration. There have been a debate in the field about which one is the dominant acceleration mechanism. But now I think people reach like a cons more or less consensus, like radio diffusion. They both work together, but then sometimes radio diffusion bring in and then local acceleration you know, works, you know, have a second like a pump and they get an even higher energy. So we're kind of reaching that stage. People kind of stop arguing which one is the dominant one because they know, okay, they may work together and then depends. And I think local heating is getting, local acceleration is getting more attention recently because we, we do have a better wave observation and particle observations. That's kind of the, yeah, history, a little bit about history. Thank you very much.